So we are going to transition into the peripheral nervous system. We're going to first address the afferent subdivision or sensory subdivision. So in chapter 10, the things or the topics that we want to address is we're going to start out by differentiating uh, between sensation and perception. Those two words may seem the same to you at, at first, but then we'll kind of pick it apart and see that they are different. We're going to talk about uh, the basic structure of sensory receptors and their function. And then we're going to look at the various types or modes of receptors, including motor receptors, chemoreceptors, thermoreceptors, and uh, mechanoreceptors. So these, these terms should be kind of familiar. We've talked about um, these terms before. And then we're going to add something which may be new to you, talking about those receptors. Then we're going to move on and talk about uh, sensory afferent receptors and how they may adapt. So we'll differentiate uh, tonic versus phasic receptor adaptation. We're going to describe the receptive field for a and sensory receptor. And then we're going to see how or discuss mechanisms which the central nervous system can differentiate a particular type of stimulus, how intense the stimulus is, and where that stimulus is coming from. So that's what we're going to uh, focus on here in chapter 10. As noted just a moment ago, we will not get into each of the specialized senses. We're just going to say receptors you follow right now. And it's and so on and so forth. Whether they be for photo perception or, or whatever it may be. So just to remind you, we've been talking about the, the nervous system for a few weeks now. Chapter 7 and 8, we just said any nerve, wherever it is, maintains a resting membrane potential, can depolarize the threshold and generate an action potential to convey different messages. In chapter nine, we uh, focused on some functions of the cells in the brain and the spinal cord. And then here we are, in the, now we're gonna get into the peripheral nervous system. Chapter 10, we're gonna focus on the sensory afferent subdivision. How our cranial and our spinal nerves, I guess you can check your work on your handout, but organs of the peripheral nervous system are our cranial and our Spinal nerves, not afferent, efferent, that function, the actual organs themselves are the cranial and spinal nerves. So check your work for your handout number five that you're going to turn in today. Your cranial and your spinal nerves, um, we're going to look at just the sensory afferent function of them, conveying somatic or body sensations, uh, special senses, or uh, visceral sensations to the central nervous system. To recap, this image is from 7.1 in your textbook. I think a lot of you would see it. So first want to uh, differentiate sensation versus perception. What do you think sensation is? So the physical experience of a stimulus. So just detecting a, a stimulus. If you sense it, you have detected a stimulus. Using a specific receptor for a specific skill. However, the sensation may not necessarily always be interpreted the same. And what happens is, is our brain creates something called perception. What is perception? What we think it is. The keyword is actually created by the brain. It's based on what you, your brain, what, you, what your brain thinks that sensation is. It may not represent reality. Yeah, ooh, right, the brain creates its own perception which may not represent reality. Perception can be created by the brain based on various types of sensations and your past experiences. Is that kind of like when you kind of spook yourself in a dark hallway? Or, um, yeah, you could spook yourself maybe. You see a shadow and you're like, 
perceive it as maybe being a person when you see a dark shadow, it actually turns out to be a dark shadow that's three. So you're still sensing a change in coloration, a light intensity, but you perceive it as being the boogeyman. It's just a three. <laughs> Immobile truth. So um, you could do it in scenarios too. Um, I could give information here and you can perceive that I'm making it up all day. But in fact, most of the stuff I tell you is a made up. Okay, so uh, all the factual information, you're picking it up, you're hearing it, and you're perceiving it as this is a bunch of malarkey, malarkey right? Uh, you can probably better illustrate this with some of these kind of brain tricks, these visual tricks, and I hope you walk through this one, what you're sensing. You're using your photoreceptors to sense um, grayscale patterns. And so you've got black, gray, white areas. And we can see a nice little pattern you need to predict it. That's what we sense. And if you look around, what do you perceive? White dots. And Three dots. white dots. Okay. White dots and? Probably see something moving. What's moving? Yeah. White dots. Which ones? Yeah. You hold the tongue. Do y'all see any? Uh, is this an animation, by the way? No. no. It's not an animation. If you look around, you may see these white dots appear and disappear between yeah. the different. But are you sensing the black dots? No. You can't be sensing because they aren't even they're not there. there. So you are perceiving the black dots. But they're not there. <laughs> so your brain doesn't think they're there. Based on your previous experiences and what you visualize. Um, experiences. You could do another kind of perception trick, if you will. Um, this one, what do you perceive, or I guess, you know, what do you perceive on this? Angling, black and white sections, smaller boxes, sloping. You see them where the gray lines look like they're sloping? Yeah. And in fact, they are. And in fact, if you guys were to go through and measure them, Parallel. And the boxes are the same size that these rocks are. So they're, pretty, they're just offset enough that your brain perceives it as a person. So again, this isn't what you're perceiving, is it reality? It's different than what you are sensing. And we could do one more uh, kind of brain trick, if you will. Another sensation perception. So you're still sensing uh, grayscale images. We're perceiving a and what are we seeing here? Something that looks like an elephant with what? <laughs> Four plus, like five plus legs, right? And then so your your brain is like, that doesn't make sense. Every elephant I've ever seen has had four legs. And you get up and you try to figure out what your brain perceives uh, what it's sensing differently. So you predict that this is an elephant that should have four legs and they didn't have five legs. doesn't work out. So, so perception, do what? It has one. I don't even know. The back leg, the only actual leg. I don't know. <laughs> That's how you perceive it. <laughs> and so each, each person's perception wouldn't match somebody else. And so we can do, this is what our brain does. And so you can do the same thing with visual information, physical sensations could be perceived differently. Uh, you know, some people you might think overreact to uh, pain and others might think underreact or whatever because your perception of the pain is different than, uh, than other people. So all, bless you, bless you. All, all sensations can be perceived uh, in varying degrees. Uh, here's another one. It may be hard to do at your desk, but if you, if y'all can like move back and forth, like focus on the black dot and then just kind of move back and forth, you might be able to see what's going on. Can y'all? Okay. That's <laughs> so if we perceive that those two circles are counter circling one another, but they're not. They're just static images for the scale of the So perception is just the brain's interpretation of the stimulus. It may not replicate reality. If we look at our receptors, we need to um, 
Can't read, say, maybe the obvious, hopefully. Uh, by now, we should appreciate that our receptors uh, pick up specific modes of stimuli. That's hopefully the constant thing that you see uh, through the semester. I need to do some extra um, explanation here, though. Up till now, we've talked about receptors as being proteins in a membrane, right? If I want to receive insulin, I have a protein insulin receptor. If I want to receive acetylcholine, I have an acetylcholine receptor or a cholinergic receptor. In the afferent nervous system, our receptors may be more complex than just a single protein. It may be an entire extra cell. The receptor may be an entire cell. The sensory receptor may be an entire cell on uh, associated with the with an afferent nerve. So it may be a big thing. It may be more than just a, a protein receptor. It may be an entire specialized cell. An example that you could see is um, the ability to pick up sensations in your skin. We have some big me mechanoreceptors or cells that kind of encirculate. So they're big cells at the end of your afferent fibers. So they're kind of on the end of your afferent nerve, and they're an extra cell uh, whose job is to pick up physical sensations. I'll show an image uh, to help you out a little bit. But the point of right now uh, is to acknowledge that our sensory afferent receptors may be more than just a protein receptor. It may be an entire what? Okay. Entire cell. So we're getting a little bit more complex if we look at the specialized sensory receptors. Some of our receptors, uh, their functional classes include photoreceptors, which give us the sensation of vision, so special sense. And so their modality or what they detect are light photons. We also have chemoreceptors which um, give us a sensation of taste and smell for uh, your olfactory nerve, for example, or your facial nerve, or there's lots of pharyngeal nerves, so you'll find chemoreceptors. Uh, in their modality, they would use typically given ion channels. Thermoreceptors pick up various what? Yeah. forms of heat, which would be cold and warm. The cold receptors actually don't even, they pick up not only cold, but also extreme heat. They're kind of interesting how they're named cold, but they also pick up like boiling temperatures, for example, the cold receptors. And so there's a little bit of dialogue in the textbook if you want to review that. Uh, mechanoreceptors respond to physical, mechanical stimuli, such as vibration, itching, stretching, your sense of sound. Auditory input is processed by using mechanoreceptors. In another class of receptors, are called nociceptors. These may be new to you. Uh, these pick up what we would categorize as the sensation of pain. And so when you are hurt, either, and I had to abbreviate it to fit, it, to fit here, chemically, mechanically, thermally, whichever, uh, the mode of pain, you're activating also nociceptors. So your body knows that this is this stimulus is pretty intense. We need to protect ourselves or start the healing process or emotional response to uh, whatever that painful stimulus may be. What questions do you have over these various um, modes of receptors, sensory afferent receptors? If we turn to figure uh, 10.2 A and B, this will, uh, sorry, will help illustrate what I was trying to describe a moment ago, that the receptor may be more complex than just a protein. It may be a set of cells basically attached to the afferent nerve. And so in this image, the sensory afferent nerve that's been conveyed towards the central nervous system, whether it be a cranial or a spinal nerve, the nerves which can maintain resting membrane potential, generating an active tension, etc., is shown in the yellow. The receptor is shown in the orange. So the receptor is not a what? What is it not? It's not a simple protein, and what else is it not? 
It's not a neuron. It's not a neuron, so it can't pass it. It cannot, yeah, so it cannot generate an action potential. Our sensory receptors are not nerves. They cannot generate action potential. Because they have a really high threshold. They have a high threshold. So that statement then explains that they can depolarize. They can depolarize, but they just won't ever reach a threshold. And so they have what type of potential could they have? If it's not an action potential, they must generate in a, well, they maintain rest, and they can generate a, a graded potential. Very good. Receptors can produce graded potentials. So they're called receptor potentials. Receptor potentials are, what, what kind of receptors? Graded. Graded. I just said graded. Graded <laughs> potentials. So they're below threshold. So in this case, in this mechanoreceptor, if something were to physically touch it, this cell would probably be permeable to sodium ions. And this receptor would do what? It would push on it, open up gated sodium channels, the cell will depolarize. And that polarity change will then be the stimulus for the for the what? For of the for which cell type? Did you say afferent? I was thinking of the cell. Very sensory, we need to pick it up and activate an afferent nerve. So the re sensory receptors are either directly associated with an afferent nerve. So when the receptor depolarizes, that depolarization um, stimulates its associated afferent nerve. That will, which may depolar depolarize to its what? To its threshold. threshold, then it could generate an action potential if that the stimulus is sufficient. So the takeaway, right, in repetition, the receptor is not a neuron. It can't generate an action potential, but it can degrade, depolarize, which would stimulate the associated typically the associated what? Neuron. Afferent nerve. If that stimulus is strong enough, then the afferent nerve itself could generate an graded and then action potential and convey it to the spinal cord for a reflex or higher processing. Figure 10 to B gives a variant of the receptor and sensory neuron association. Here the sensory receptor is a physically separate cell. And so the way that the receptor communicates with the afferent nerve is more like um, a paracrine messaging. And so there's a messenger referred to as a transmitter. We call it a neurotransmitter. It's the same as in a what? Neuron. neuron. So it's going to communicate paracrine uh, by paracrine messaging with its associated afferent nerve. So you would see this, for example, like your, um, where it says uh, stimulus, for example, your photoreceptors. Your cones and the rods communicate via your optic nerve like this, where you send a little messenger right, between the two. But the cones and the rods aren't, what are they not? They are not, they're not nerves. They can detect stimuli, but they can't reach a threshold. But if enough messenger is released, the associated nerve can Depolarize too? 
threshold and generate maximum of interest. Are we okay? Our sensory receptors are a bit more complex than just a little protein. They may be entire cells associated with the afferent nerve or really uh, adjacent to the respective afferent nerve. We had identified um, a moment ago that the receptor itself cannot generate an maximum potential, but it can be polarized. So you would call that a receptor potential. So if you say receptor potential, you are implying a graded uh, depolarization. Receptor potential is a, a, a another way to say a graded depolarization in a sensory afferent receptor. Easier to say what? Receptor potential. The receptor potential is illustrated here. Um, you have a similar image, and I failed to put the number uh, of, of the image. This is coming from chapter 10. And the blue plot is the presence of some stimulus, whether it be chemical or mechanical or whatever. That stimulus is going to activate, in this case, we can see the receptors associated with the afferent nerve. And if you look at the receptor potentials, um, threshold's not shown, so they are below threshold. The stronger the stimulus, the stronger the what? The potential, the receptor potential. So there's a direct relationship between the stimulus intensity and the receptor potential, which translates into action at the afferent nerve. If we measure the afferent nerve in response to the receptor potentials, there's a direct <laughs> correlation there. So stronger stimulus causes stronger graded or receptor potentials, which causes the afferent nerve to generate action potentials. What can we see here? What do you think is the difference between here? Closer together, more frequent. So the more frequent together faster, you know, more often, better way to say that. Which at the end of the nerve cell causes what? More neurotransmitter to the nerves. There's a direct correlation between that receptor potential and uh, the effect at the afferent nerve. What questions you have about what a receptor is or uh, what a receptor potential is? Our receptors also have the ability to adapt to an unchanging stimulus. Some do, not all do. The types of receptor adaptation are called um, tonic and phasic adaptation. In tonic adaptation, in an, uh, when a um, stimulus is unchanging, for example, oxygen in your blood is relatively uh, it seems like it's at set point, right? Or it should be at set point, right? It seems like it's unchanging. So when there's a when there's an ever-present stimulus, so you always got oxygen in your blood, you've always got carbon dioxide in your blood, so on and so forth. When some factor is constant, ever-present, tonic receptors would not adapt. What that means, or are unlikely to adapt. What that means is they would are unlikely to stop detecting that stimulus. Tonic receptors are unlikely to stop detecting a consistently present stimulus, like oxygen in your blood, like carbon dioxide in your blood, like blood pressure in your uh, aortic arch, for example. So as long as that stimulus is there, these receptors are just going to continually monitor pressure, oxygen, carbon dioxide, so on and so forth. Which you think, well, that seems logical. The receptor's job is to receive, right? But if we contrast that to some other receptors, some are some can adapt to an, um, an ever-present stimulus. That means what? Is, what does that mean? That they can adapt. They'll stop responding. They'll stop responding, even though what? The st stimuli is still happening. Even though the stimulus is still there. 
In basic receptor adaptation, the receptor adapts or stops um, depolarizing in the presence of an unchanging or constant stimulus. Does that seem okay? Why is that okay? So what kind of what kind of stimuli is, is it okay for us to not monitor all the time? What? Oh, we want to monitor adrenaline all the time. That'd be a chemical in our blood. I don't want to keep an eye on it. Those are those are monitored not just by our nervous system. They're monitored by our immune system. Very good. That's a great example. So like an auditory stimulus. The birds chirping, the wife nagging. <laughs> uh, but more like something you could appreciate in more clothes, articles of clothing. So you're ever present if you're in public, hopefully. Yeah, ever present. Sunglasses on your head. You ever done that? You forget and you go start looking for something. You know, like they're on your head because your receptors have keys in, keys in your hand. <laughs> yeah, keys in your hand or something because your receptors have adapted. So some things, like mechan mechanically speaking, don't need to be monitored continuously. So hopefully you're wearing right. Not, but you're wearing a piece of clothing for a period of time, or your favorite ball cap, or your wedding ring, or, or something mechanical or auditory. Um, those types of receptors can adapt. What's interesting about um, receptor adaptation, though, is as long as that stimulus is present, the receptor adapts. And then when the stimulus is gone, the receptor has an off response. And so then when it goes away, when the birds stop chirping, you're like, what happened to the birds? It's quiet, right? <laughs> Or like when this, you get the kids and you hear them and you stop hearing them and you're like, what's going on? Um, and so there's an off response. So if you take your, your cap off and you feel like you acknowledge that you're taking it off, right? So they have a really cool uh, off response as well. What questions do you have about differentiating between chronic and basic receptor adaptation? Can basic work with pain? It can. It can. Um, so there's two types of pain, um, two different modes of pain, and so some of the like most intense pain, you've got to adapt, and the limbic system has to kind of override so that you don't maybe go into shock. So to sort of try to prevent it in that case, but uh, some types of pain do not adapt, uh, and so there's variants of the the the, 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 the nerve receptors. I can't recall the the terminology right now, but there's different types of, uh, of pain. So some pain receptors can, others uh, cannot. Does it depend on like the area or like how much of a pain it is or what kind it is? It depends on the type of the receptor um, and the modality of the nose receptors. And so there's different modes of receptors like nose receptors, the P, the temperature, the chemo receptor. And so um, it, it should be in there. So if, after, if you want to look real quick for me or um, on those receptors, you want to go to the, to the back section and uh, the appendix. It have you some direction in there. But, um, uh, polymodal. I don't think there's a polymodal one. I think I'll have to review it. I think there's one that can adapt uh, a bit more quickly, but I don't want to speak completely wrong. So <laughs> I'll look it up for you. So, so some of your pain receptors can, but a lot of times it's not very good or safe for your body to, uh, to adapt to a painful stimulus because that pain is there for a reason, right? Mm -hmm. And so for your body to protect itself and heal itself. And so you don't want to completely uh, ignore the pain. But and certainly sometimes you think about chronic pain, people who've been in that pain for years, they kind of adapt to the pain to get used to it, if you will. Good question. I'll, after class, I'm going to look up better for you. Additional questions? So uh, we studied that uh, some receptors can adapt, some may not. 
and um, the receptors, afferent receptors may be structures at the end of our afferent nerves or really closely associated to our afferent nerve. Additionally, our receptors may have various sized receptor receptive fields. What does that mean? Receptive field. Somatic way gives us tells it gets us somewhere. Right? The field, the area that that particular receptive field monitors or is receptive to. So not all sensory receptors have the same receptive field. There's figure 10.5 uh, is illustrated here. What do you think the correlation is between um, receptive fields and precision of um, detecting and, and localizing, characterizing the signal? I think the correlation is between the receptive fields. So we'll go just generic small, large uh, receptive fields with precision. allow for more precision. I'm just going to be more precise. Which is more precise, a, re a sensory receptor that has to monitor a large receptive field or a smaller receptive field? A smaller, smaller, smaller one is going to be much more precise than a larger one. There's a direct correlation, uh, I guess the proper term would be indirect correlation or inverse is a better way to say that, correlation between the receptive field size and the precision of the receptor. So the smaller the receptive field is, the more precise and accurate it is at detecting and characterizing a particular signal. So not only just detecting it, your brain has to code the stimulus or interpret the stimulus. And um, we addressed a little bit of this a moment ago looking at that uh, previous image. The way that your brain or spinal cord interprets, interprets this, the intensity of a particular stimulus is how frequent the afferent nerve generates action potentials. So let's just clarify on your notes that the action potentials are in the what? Afferent nerve, not the, not the sensory receptor. Not the receptor. But that frequency of action potentials generated by the afferent nerve, depending upon the stimulus of the, detected by the sensory receptor. So the more frequent an afferent nerve generates action potentials, the central nervous system is going to interpret that as a stronger stimulus. So for example, mechanically speaking, taking a, um, a feather and lightly touching your finger versus taking um, vice grips and squeezing your finger. And so we're still using mechanoreceptors, right? But the intensity of the two is very different. So the number of receptors but um, the frequency of action potentials, what do you think about the two? The frequency of action potentials. Is a love feather touch or a vice grip squeeze? More frequent, so the frequency would be greater. Uh, with that stronger stimulus than the vice grip, even though we're using the same receptors in the same area. So your brain would interpret that as a stronger mechanical stimulus than just a light brush of a feather, for example which is also using the canner receptors in that target. Yeah. Can I use like an analogy, like, because I have a little trouble, like, so say like, here's my analogy, maybe not the correct one. Like, if someone's like, grabbing you real hard and you're like, hitting them a million times, is that kind of how it is? Like, stop or so, and this is happening? Yeah, so frequency would be like, yeah, how often? So, um, the way the, the body interprets uh, the stimulus is how frequent the action potentials are generated. So. How fast you are, like if you were to try to say no, okay, so if I were to say no to you, and I'd go whack, 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 10 times in a second, yeah. and then that would be interpreted as a big stimulus versus if it was if Alicia tried to put in 10 seconds with one tap, that'd be less frequent, so that'd be a, a less stimulus. So hitting, physical. <laughs> that's a good analogy, right? Sure. Okay. That's a violent analogy. <laughs> 
again, is that the frequency of action potentials, because the more, what an action potential on a nerve is going to result in that nerve releasing neurotransmitters. So the more frequent it generates action potentials, the more neurotransmitters it's going to release in a shorter amount of time. Then we can go back to the synapse. The more neurotransmitter combined to more neurotransmitter binds to the receptors. To what? Receptors. To receptors that you know in the neuron or wherever we're going. Okay. So the frequency, how often those action potentials are generated, the more often they are uh, generated, the more strong the uh, stimulus is, is coded for or, or characterized as. Isn't that like Yes, if the, um, if the receptor doesn't adapt. So as long as the stimulus is present, it continues to activate the receptor. The receptor will continue to degrade and then communicate to the action potential. So if it's persistent and your receptors don't adapt, you don't continue to generate action potential. And so I think your question is, do they adapt? Is, is kind of where you're going, and not necessarily. Action the thermal receptors being <laughs> frequently depolarized. Uh, additionally, uh, within a uh, sensory receptor, not only the action potentials help code the intensity, but the number of receptors in a given area, uh, which is referred to as population coding. If there are more receptors in a given area activated, that's interpreted as a larger stimulus. So if we could go back to the vice grip uh, scenario, I could take it maybe a needle through those pliers and contrast that to. A larger diameter pliers and squeeze. And that's the stimulus is the same, but one has a wider diameter than the other. The one with the wider diameter would be perceived as a larger, right, greater stimulus. So this is, in addition, you may be activating more than just one receptor, maybe actually multiple of those. And so this next image in your textbook, this is the one that I failed to put the, the, um, the figure number on. And this may help you. The more frequent, like the Holly, that you're asking me about the action potential uh, conduction. Uh, the closer the action potentials are shown here by the, the green spike, the closer they are, that's more frequent. These are the, the hitting, right? The less frequent they are um, is interpreted as a, a weaker signal. So this visual, I, I'm going to help help a little bit. Less, greater stimulus, greater depolarization, more frequent action potentials in the sensory nerve itself, not in the receptor. In a visual, um, to illustrate how multiple receptors could be used to interpret a stronger stimulus. Um, on the far left, we have um, some stimulus, a weak stimulus and a strong stimulus. Just indicating the intensity of the errors. If there's just a single nerve cell, sensory nerve that monitors a wide area, so its receptive field is large, we have a weak stimulus and activating, in this case, four little axon terminals, which can be interpreted as a pretty moderate uh, stimulus. By contrast, in the same area where one sensory nerve monitors a large uh, receptive field, there's intensity of the stimulus is increasing and now we're activating more of the receptors in that little receptive field, but it's still associated with a single nerve. So that would be perceived um, as a little bit more intense. However, if we look at other parts of our body, other parts of our bodies, the receptors may have a smaller receptive field. So the same weak stimulus is still perceived as maybe being a weak stimulus. However, the more strong stimulus in a different part of the body where um, there are more sensory nerves and more sensory receptors, and the receptive field is what? The, the, the nerve field would be smaller compared to over here where they're larger. This same stimulus is actually maybe perceived as maybe um, three points instead of maybe a single point. Let's give you a, a visual. Okay, so let's, let's take, uh, you can take something uh, connected to your pen tip for example. 
just take your pin tip or the pointy or something that you can physically right, touch and take part of it and just put it on your back. It's going to be hard because you're doing it, you're testing yourself, but right, press it there. Now use the exact same point of your pen and then put it on your lip. Try to push it at the same angle. Is there any difference in the way you perceive this beam? Did you use the sharp pointy point? You probably jabbed it a little harder into your, right? you also have the closing as well. But uh, if you were to repeat it again, right, which part of your body are you going to be able to check that same, same stimulus with better detail? On the lip. Because we have more, more sensory afferent nerves in the receptive field as much smaller so the precision is there. I mean you could probably even uh, run your finger if you've got um, like these plastic mechanical pencils that they've got the name in the AI. Mm -hmm. Right you could even right, run your well this one you know sometimes they're like root marked into the press is what I'm trying to say in there. You could probably even run your finger on there and fill those letters like what you're using Braille or something. But then you could do the same thing back to, I'm sorry I'm running my pencil. <laughs> 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 oh, sorry about that I'll give you a new pencil. <laughs> Right, and so if I did that in the same thing on my back, I wouldn't be able to even try to pick up those ridges, for example. And so the number of receptors uh, in the receptive field is correlated to the intensity of how your brain interprets it. But make sure they do a little bit though. We're still using mechanoreceptors in those scenarios, but the parts of our body have different size receptors uh, and numbers of atheric nerves serving them. So this next bit, um, localization can also not only just intensity but location of the stimulus is dependent upon the receptor field and um, how much our receptors in the body are activated if they overlap or not. We could do a similar test instead of using one point, we could use two points. And so you could take, um, like, remember a compass or tool, right? We did those circles. Uh, you could take something like that or take two pencils and have your, you can test yourself later, maybe have your lab partner take two pencils and press them on your back and then take the same distance and press them on your face and see if you could tell any difference if you're picking up one or two stimuli. In that case, if you were to do the two pencil test, press them on your back, it probably would feel like a single point versus, you know, it's just two because the receptor field is bigger and it's going to activate fewer atheric nerves. And so it's just the, Different parts of our body have different size receptors, but it helps us localize it um, where the stimulus is right, for precision. No matter what the stimulus is, um, if we need to cognate it, it's going to be conveyed to the central nervous system. Right? If you're looking more distalized in the, in the periphery of the body, our afferent nerves will conduct action potentials to our spinal cord. And if it's cognate, it's right now you're thinking about. The ridges on your pencil, right? And sharpness of the of the tips of those. And so those conveyed up what type of track we call these? Afferent or the decision nerves themselves. In the spinal cord we have extending, which would synapse in the thalamus and sent over to the somatosensory right, cortex for our perception of that particular stimulus. It looks like that concludes chapter 10 for us. All right, so we're still in the peripheral nervous system, but we're transitioning to chapter 11, which is our efferent nervous system, which gives our motor control over our various effector organs. What we're going to do is contrast the somatic efferent nervous system to the autonomic uh, nervous system, including the two subdivisions, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic division. We're going to look at the primary neurotransmitters released by each of the nerve types, whether they be somatic or autonomic. Then we're going to incorporate this term called a dual innervation, which I told you not, asked you not to get confused with reciprocal innervation. So we'll talk about that uh, characteristic of the autonomic nervous system, and then repeat the uh, the term reciprocal innervation uh, for the somatic nervous system. So we're going with our same reminder from chapter 7.1. Uh, again, 7 and 8, any nerve 
Uh, nine, we covered the central nervous system. Ten, we just wrapped up the sensory afferent nervous system, how we specialize receptors, uh, code for different types of stimuli. Now we're going to look at how the central nervous system can coordinate motor output for our skeletal muscles and for our cardiac muscle, our smooth muscle, and our gland using the somatic nervous system and the autonomic nervous system. This image should look familiar in that we, um, <laughs> we drew it and we used it to illustrate a reflex arc. And so we should be able to start putting the nervous system together. In order for us to carry out physical responses, we need our efferent nerves to control our effector organs, like our skeletal muscle and smooth muscles and cardiac muscle, for example. The structure of the nerves to the effector organ flow is very much different between the somatic nervous system, the voluntary nervous system, and the involuntary autonomic nervous system. And that's what we're going to uh, differentiate today. When we go through and contrast the autonomic versus the somatic nervous system, the effector organs are different, which we just clarified. The effector organs of the somatic nervous system are our the pun, skeletal muscle. While the effector organs of the autonomic nervous system include the smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, and gland. So the effector organs are different. The nerve, the efferent nerves are built differently between the somatic and the autonomic nervous system. The neurotransmitters are variable as well between the somatic versus the autonomic nervous system. And therefore, because our neurotransmitters are different, the, as a target, the receptors are different, and the response is different as well. The first thing we're going to do is look at the autonomic nervous system. You may recall that there are two subcategories of the autonomic nervous system called the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system is your, right, both are involuntary. So you involuntary control over your heart, uh, smooth muscle, and other glands. The sympathetic nervous system dominates during times of stress or excitement. So your fight or flight is what you would have called it before. By contrast, the parasympathetic nerves regulate organs during times of rest. What we're going to call rest and digest. So when you're relaxing, for example, the parasympathetic nervous system will prevail. If we correlate this to um, this term called dual innervation, you recall innervation just means an organ has what? Nerves in it. Uh, we can use a word called, or term called dual, let's see, uh, innervation. Dual innervation tells us that many of our internal organs that we involuntarily regulate have what? Dual means two. So it has sympathetic and parasympathetic fibers in it. So those organs that are duly innervated can be controlled during times of like fight or flight or rest and digest by just using one class right, of uh, just one autonomic nervous system. Right? So involuntarily, we can control the same organ either sympathetically or parasympathetically, depending on what's going on in your body. So organs are, involuntary organs exhibit what? Dual innervation, meaning they have both somatic nerves in them and also what? Not somatic, sympathetic uh -huh. nerves and also parasympathetic. I'm going to restate that. They have both sympathetic and parasympathetic nerves in them. Would they have some, I misspoke, would they have somatic nerves in them? Like your heart, would it have a somatic nerve? Somatic efferent? No, because that would mean skeletal muscle. So I just misspoke. Things that are duly innervated would have sympathetic and 
parasympathetic fibers in them to precisely control them during times of excitation or rest. mentioned a moment ago that our autonomic nerves are built differently and what's different about them is that it's not one nerve cell that extends out to affect the organ it's how many two nerve cells that ex extend out to the effector organ the first cell we're going to call the preganglion cell so label this as the preganglion cell it's extending from the central nervous system. So remember, so let's put it in perspective. Remember, we looked at the spinal, excuse me, yeah, the spinal cord, for example, the motor etheric nerves exit on which side of the spinal cord? The ventral. And you may recall we said, well, those motor nerve cell bodies have to be located exclusively in the central nervous system. Okay, so that would be your etheric nerve. Yes, it does originate the central nervous system but technically it's a peripheral nerve it just starts there so this cell would be referred to as the what preganglion g-a-n-g-l-i-o-n preganglion cell the first one do what i was looking down both times you said okay the 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 first cell the cell that originates extends out of the central nervous system the motor nerve that extends out of the central nervous system you could refer to as the preganglion cell. We used this word before when we're talking about our neurotransmitter. We actually may have it buried in a long term memory. The preganglion cell releases which neurotransmitter? Acetylcholine. Good job. Right. So the preganglion cell, this one. Go ahead and write it down, squeeze it in there. It releases acetylcholine. The preganglion cell releases acetylcholine to another cell we could label as the postganglion cell or postganglion neuron. The postganglion cell is the one that extends to the effector organs. What are our effector organs of the autonomic nervous system? Are you going to see them? Autonomic nervous system controls your cardiac muscle, smooth muscle, and your GI tract. Glands, uh, adipose too. Um, there's a cool research article that came out recently. Someone actually got some um, nice uh, composal microscopy images of it. And I'll see if I can share that with you guys. But they're actually integrated with adipose tissue as well. So we said the preganglion cell releases which neurotransmitter? Acetylcholine. So our postganglion cell better have receptors for. Acetylcholine. Do you may remember which receptors or postganglion cells express? Very good. Nicotinic receptors. Nicotinic receptors cause the postganglion cell to do what in the presence of acetylcholine? Depolarize. Postganglion cell, depending on where it's going, or if you're looking at a sympathetic nerve or a parasympathetic nerve, it's going to release any of the other like, neurotransmitters, peripheral neurotransmitters, which we studied in chapter eight. The postganglion cell is going to release either acetylcholine or epinephrine or norepinephrine. It's not going to release all of them. Each nerve would release one of those types of neurotransmitters. You recall we said the receptor neurotransmitter relationship is constant. So the postganglion cell, if it's a parasympathetic nerve, it's, it's going to release acetylcholine. And your sympathetic, your fight or flight nerves release 
Epinephrine and norepinephrine. So your recept your target cells, your effector organs need what? They need what? Receptors. And so if that pre if that postganglion cell releases acetylcholine, that target cell needs a and we call it we can call it acetylcholine. We're gonna call it on, on Tuesday, we're gonna call it a bigotinic receptor. If the postganglion cells releases epinephrine. The target cell needs, what do we call them? What's the name of these? <laughs> Chapter 8, what's the name of the epinephrine receptor? It's not epinephrine receptor. Adrenergic. Good job. Adrenergic. Adrenergic receptor. Alpha adrenergic, beta adrenergic. So the postganglion cells, depending on if it's sympathetic or parasympathetic, may release acetylcholine or epinephrine or uh, norepinephrine. But the preganglion always releases what? Acetylcholine. Whether you're looking at a sympathetic or parasympathetic nerve, it's always going to release acetylcholine. The response at the, at the effector organ is what? The autonomic nerve activates it. What's the response? It could be movement, it could be suppression of movement, it could be secretion, stopping through, and what, who knows, we got trillions of cells in our body that could be innervated autonomically. The reason I can't really say what it is, we're looking at so many different targets, so many different types of neurotransmitters, so many different types of receptors. So most of our organs are duly innervated, what does that mean again? have both parasympathetic and sympathetic fibers in them. Figure 11.1 .1 in your textbook helps illustrate this dual innervation of your organs. It's not a really good image to project, but you should be able to see at least the color differences between the green and the pink, the green and the purple the differences. Uh, and if you look at the different organs, say your lungs, your heart, so on and so forth, if you look at those organs, you'll see they have each the purple um, parasympathetic cells, and then also the green, or maybe, yeah, I, I know what color script, green uh, sympathetic. So the heart has both parasympathetic and sympathetic fibers. So the heart is duly innervated. We can control it during times of fight or times of rest using two, or each subdivision of the autonomic nervous system. The adrenal medulla is a unique structure in that it doesn't have a classic nerve cell look to it, but so therefore it's considered to be a modified postganglion cell. And so this tells us that the cells, the adrenal medulla, highlighted here in the yellow, uh, will release our sympathetic neurotransmitters, epinephrine and norepinephrine, when innervated by a sympathetic preganglion cell. So the sympathetic preganglion cell is shown here in the blue thing. In the, in the cells of the adrenal medulla would release epinephrine and norepinephrine into the blood during times of what? Uh, fight or flight. Fight or flight. So sympathetic preganglion cell releases which neurotransmitter? Acetylcholine. Acetylcholine. Our, um, they're called promethin cells. You don't need to what you say the modified postganglion cells have what type of receptors? Nicotinic. Very good. They're receiving acetylcholine. And then when activated, they can release epinephrine, norepinephrine into the blood, which goes into the blood for system wide distribution. During your times of fight or flight. It's just mobilizing your energy sources. So the adrenal medulla is a unique right, postganglion cell. Additionally, our 
autonomic nervous system is built, everything's different, right? Everything's the same, you know, can. And the autonomic nerves 